Aloha and welcome from Waikiki Beach to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. We believe at Deep Adventure Ministries that the most radical thing you can do in life is abandon yourself to the wild adventure of God's will. And wild doesn't mean like playing in the rough uh, uh, when you're golfing. <laughs> wild isn't taking a walk, you know, through a park. We're talking about God who created the quasars, who created the universe, who created dinosaurs, and who created you. Um, he's not anyone to be trifled with, but he's certainly someone you would want to get to know. We're going to be talking with Stephen Ray more about his uh, his uh, love for Jesus and his, his love for the early church fathers and his conversion uh, to the Catholic Church. We'll be right back with more of the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Kickstart that engine and roll thunder with the pack. Explore the grittiness of manly spirituality. Gain traction in the virtues. Zoop up your spiritual engine by turning adversity into adventure. Now here's Bear Wozniak. Let's ride. Aloha. Welcome back to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. I'm going to give a little intro here before I bring Stephen Ray on board. You know, at the age of 19, I had a powerful conversion experience. It was through the days of the Catholic charismatic renewal. And I was prayed with. I didn't expect what would happen. But I said, I saw people who really love Jesus. And I said, I want more of what you have. And they said, well, you need to really think about that because this costs you everything. We're not going to pray with you. You wait a week and come back. And if you really want to devote your life to the Lord, we will pray with you. And so a week went by and they prayed with me and I experienced this power, powerful, powerful conversion. And, I, and from that moment, all I could do was tell people about Jesus. But as a young Catholic, I, 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 even though here I was on fire for the Lord, I was under catechized. I, w I didn't know that there were great books. Isn't this ridiculous? As much as I love the Lord, I thought there was the Bible, and then 400 years ago people started writing books about Jesus. And so I would only write. I would only read authors from the last twenty years, the last hundred years, and maybe maybe a hundred and fifty years. And I, I became uh, dismayed. And actually, you know, I, I these were the people that meant so much to me. So I pursued them, and I left the Catholic Church. I didn't really leave it. I just joined with people that I that I knew were going deeper with the Lord, and and uh, and were in my life. And so I, I I left the Catholic Church for a season. And after a while, I was just like, Is that all there is? I felt like I was kind of swimming in the shallow end of the pool. I wanted, I had a hunger to go deeper. And fortunately, at the same time, my father and my mother and the rest of my family actually had that similar conversion experience. As Catholics, they had uh, that, that deep transformational experience of, of the Holy Spirit. And my dad and mom continued on in the Catholic Church, and my dad eventually became a Catholic deacon. And one day, he sent me this book called Crossing the Tiber by our guest, Stephen Ray. And it, it took my breath away. It, 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 the book outlines his story of his conversion. He is, is he communicating it to his father while he was becoming a Catholic. And all these footnotes. Who are these guys? Who's Justin Martyr? Who's St. Irenaeus? Who's, who, who, are these, who are these writers? And their, their writings took my breath away. And so... Uh, I came roaring back to the Catholic Church. I found the Catholic Catechism. It hadn't been written when I was 19 years old. And I read that cover to cover. And then I said, I'm going to read all of Augustine's books. And I read the Confessions, and I read uh, the, the City of God. And then I realized, oh, he wrote more than I could read in a lifetime. And then I picked up Aquinas. And then I, and then I picked up the, all the volumes of the early church fathers that you can buy. I think there's like 24 or so volumes. And then I, and then I got this book, the Commentary Commentary. The ancient Christian commentary on Scripture. I got that whole volume set. It's a, it goes line by line through the Bible with the writings of the early church fathers. But this man, Stephen Ray, brought me roaring back to the Catholic Church because I read the words of Justin Martyr about the Eucharist. I was like, dude, if that's the way they did that in the primitive church, that's the same stuff I saw and heard when I was a kid. What am I thinking? What am I doing? What have I been missing out on? And I just didn't go into the deep end of the pool. I paddled out into the deep like a surfer going out here in Hawaii. If you paddle out three miles, 
uh, you're no longer in 200 feet of water. You're in three miles deep of water. And that's what I feel like the breadth and the depth of the Catholic teaching. Oh, you can never get enough. And so Stephen Ray, that's my introduction. You radically forever changed my life. And, I'm, and, and it's not just because of the cool hats you wear either. <laughs> Welcome well, to our show. <laughs> I don't know if there's any le- anything left to say here, Bear. That was quite the opening. I'm, Steve- uh, I'm very moved by that and gratified and humbled by that. Uh, the, the book was, my dad is, a, we're Baptist. My dad was a deacon and he was furious at me for even reading Catholic books. Not just, I hadn't even said I'm becoming Catholic. I was just reading Catholic books. I'd never done that before. And he was furious and clenched his fists and his veins popped out. You must be backslidden to even think about these things, he said. Well, uh, my dad was the best dad in the whole world. Uh, he, he made huge sacrifices for us kids. And he was the best dad ever in the whole world. And I wrote a letter and it started this way. Dear dad, you're the best father in the world. And I owe you an explanation. And I started to write him a letter and I quoted Justin Martyr and Ignatius of Antioch. But I know dad didn't know who they were. So I put a footnote down there to explain who they were. And then the footnotes kept getting more and more because I knew dad didn't know who these guys were. And it was interesting because my dad was so concerned about what his pastor was saying today, but had no idea what the very first pastor said 2000 years ago. So I was trying to introduce him to those pastors. See, Well, it got longer and longer. And when we finally decided to become Catholics, my daughter was 16, my son was 13, smart kids, and they both said, we're not going to join with you. And I said, why not? And they said, Dad, you homeschooled us. Did you forget what you taught us about the Catholic Church and homeschooling <laughs> as Baptists? Well, I had just finished writing the rough draft of that letter to my dad, and I, I said to my daughter, Cindy, would you do me a favor? I'm going to send Grandpa a letter. Next week, would you proofread it for me first? Now, I may be dumb, Bear, but I'm not stupid. You're clever. I, I gave her that letter out of that old, remember the old dot matrix printers? Oh, <laughs> painful I to even think that. of. <laughs> it brings back bad memories, doesn't it? <laughs> well, I printed that out and I gave it to my son and my daughter, 13 years old, 16 years old. They went upstairs at four o'clock in the afternoon and they did not come down for dinner. And I said to my wife, just leave them alone. They're reading the letter I wrote my dad. At 10 o'clock at night, they came down. Those pages were soaked with their tears. And they said, Dad, it's a good letter. We're going to join with you. And they were the first converts as a result of that book before it was ever a book. Father Fessio at Ignatius Press saw it. and He said, Steve, we want to publish that book. It was never going to be a book, Bear. You would have never seen it. It was a letter to my dad. And I think that's why it's resonated with people, because it's a love letter, really. It's gently. It's beautifully written from a man who loves Jesus and, and loves the Lord and loves his fa- loves his father. Yep, that's really what it was. And, and I came up with crossing the Tiber because people don't know what that means, but the Tiber River runs through Rome. Yeah, I was wondering, crossing the Tiber, he doesn't even know how to spell tiger. He spells it Yeah, weird. that's right. It's a T-I-B-R-E. And, and yeah. People say it's crossing the timber yeah. or crossing the tiger. <laughs> <laughs> but the river, the river that runs through Rome, like the Thames, runs through London. Yeah. And the river uh, Tiber flows through Rome. And it's a way of symbolically saying, I'm leaving the world, I'm crossing over the Tiber River, and I'm coming to St. Peter's, I'm coming to the Vatican to become a Catholic. So crossing the Tiber means I'm leaving it all behind, I'm crossing the river, and I end up at the front door of the Vatican, and I'm saying I'm going to become a child of the Catholic Church. But I think your father thought it was like you were crossing the Rubicon. (laughs) I know. <laughs> that was a declaration of war. <laughs> uh, but it's, it's uh, Steve, uh, I remember bumping into you, by the way, in Jerusalem a few years ago. I don't know if you remember, Marcus, I think Mark uh, uh, D'Ambrosio was there, and I was with Father Don Calloway. And uh, I forget the name of the hotel that we were staying at there, but it's probably the one you always stay at. Um, but it, it just meant you, you really means so much to me and it's what interesting is this was a letter from you to your father and it was my father that gave me that book to read who by the way became a catholic who was a catholic deacon and uh, he's paid, he, he died on september in september of this last year and i got to be with him stephen oh, and nice. uh it was beautiful because we brought him to my sister's house we had like almost like a chapel ready for him and knowing that he was going to die 
and uh, we were le- reading his homilies. He was a great homilist. He was a professional speaker before he, his conversion. And uh, I, when I say conversion, I mean he was a Catholic, but when he really gave his heart to the Lord. And we were reading his homilies out loud, and then th- there came that moment when I knew, my nephew and I knew that he was passing. I put my hand on his heart and felt his last beats, and I knew wow. he was with my mother in heaven. But I, I tell, but my dad was such a jokester, so I tell people um, th- that reading, when we were reading his homilies, he died of boredom. <laughs> but he we're fell t- eternally asleep. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, it's interesting too, when my mother passed away, my ministry exploded. I mean, I know oh. the communion of the saints is valid and that my mother and father are praying for me right now. But we're talking with Stephen Ray. Um, I, I can't believe it. I need to get you on my show more often. I, you know who one of my favorite guests is? Mike Aquilina, obviously, for the similar reasons. is his love of the early church fathers. When we get back, we're going to talk with Stephen Ray about what it means to be an early church father and what they have to teach us and about all of his great— you know, he wears these Indiana Jones hats— I couldn't pull off wearing them, but wherever you are, it's because you are Indiana Jones. You travel the world le- leading pilgrimages. What's your next, what's your pilgrimage you're going to be leading in September, by the way? We're taking one to uh, Israel in September, November, and over Christmas break. So three to oh. Israel. Uh, and then we're doing a St. Paul cruise. We're going to hit 10 biblical sites through the Mediterranean uh, in October. And we're going to Lourdes and Fatima from Portugal, Spain, and France in um Late. Uh, that's also in September. Well, we'll, so we'll talk here. about that when we get back because we got to take yeah. a break. But that's at catholicconvert.com. And I'll talk to you when we get back about surfing in Israel. Okay. <laughs> we'll be right back with more of the Bear Wozniak adventure. This is Daniel LaVoon Markham with another episode of Country Up. Gitter. If you don't know it in your knower, you better get it in your gitter because if you haven't got it in your gitter, you'll never know it. Yep, you heard that right. Information ain't understanding any more than understanding is wisdom. Knowing is just a nod of your head, but knowing something in your knower means you got understanding. But before the knowing, you got to get information into your gitter. Your gitter is a place where the information is caught rather than see it as a flyby. Got it? Good. Having fun yet? I am. Folks today know boo information thanks to the internet, but it's mostly information without context. Regarding context, it can be likened to people saying they want socialism. I get wanting a lot of free stuff, but there ain't no free lunch partner. Somebody paid for it or will pay for it. The chickens will come home to roost. Folks who lived through the Cold War and beyond got context to socialism, They saw how it eventually ruined everything it touched. Their context got them wise concerning politicians promising more and more free stuff. Jesus said a good tree cannot bear bad fruit and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Took time for the bitter fruit of socialism to ripen and be eaten. It always got to be a nasty tasting. So the story of the Mori is this. Get context to what you're reading and hearing. We need more folks with wisdom rather than a bunch of semi-automatic word slingers. King Solomon wrote, Wisdom will be life for you. Wisdom, not words, ensures your tree will produce good fruit. Take a bite and enjoy. This is Daniel the Boone Markham at countryup.org on a journey a few miles this side of heaven. man. I don't want you to miss out on your free stuff at deepadventure.com. Go there and subscribe to our weekly email newsletter. You get free video content, including the Bear Wozniak radio show, video version on YouTube before it even airs on EWTN. And you can follow us on all of our social media. Go to deepadventure.com and subscribe. Get your free stuff. And if you're watching on YouTube, don't forget to press the subscribe button and ring that little bell. Don't miss out. This is a warning. The Bear Wozniak Adventure is dangerous. The radical change Bear challenges you to is not for wimps. Change this station now to a soft rock station before it's too late. You've been warned. Now, here is Bear Wozniak.
Aloha, welcome back to the Bear Wazig adventure. I dig on this guy. I dig on, I really dig on Stephen Ray. There's, he's about the only guy I know who could pull off wearing that hat. It's like an Indiana Jones hat. I've seen pictures of you all over the place. I think riding a camel with it, or you know, going into a, a ancient archaeological place, and and it just suits you so, just suits you so well. Yeah, but I got to so tell I, you, I, yeah, people. When I, I I got it because when we started doing our, our documentary series in the Middle East, yes, yeah, so I remember that. I watched that. Um, I went the first time without my hat, and <laughs> by the end of the day, my head was like a red beet. It was so burned and hot i couldn't even wrinkle my forehead my <laughs> wife got me this hat and she said steve if we're going to be over all the time you're going to have this hat it's a fantastic but, hat i want one do you do you, you should market them as the Stephen ray hat. market them put footprints <laughs> of god on it well i i when i went to a conference then one day they said you're not steve ray go back and get your hat and come back and absolutely we'll, no one would you. recognize you so now that i wear it everywhere and i actually do have the nickname jerusalem jones and if you go to there jerusalemjones.com, it goes right to my website. So I'm kind of the Catholic crocodile hunter, the Catholic <laughs> adventurer. And you know well, what's fun what, yeah. there is that young people come up to me, and I, it's like they want to meet me. They want to shake my hand because I'm the guy that fell in the mud, that wrestled the snake, that rode the camel <laughs> and the black stallion around the pyramids. Of yes, the I remember that. Yeah, These kids want to come up and meet me. And if I can be a hero for young kids and bring them into the excitement of the Catholic faith, well, then God bless us. Amen. Amen. Well, I was. we've been talking. You know, by the way, I went to Baylor University. I'm a Baylor University graduate. The university, as it's known to Southern Baptists, and yeah, I, I just you know I was there that I had a professor. Uh, we had to take religion, and he was a professor of the Old Testament. And I thought, dude, these guys are like Indiana Jones. I mean, I dug on them because they could speak multiple languages. They they had been to the they had been to the sites. They knew the history, knew the, the new, yeah. knew the story yeah. around it, and it made it so rich. And it was at Baylor when all my Southern Baptist friends were praying for me. Like, he's got to be, you know, I was a Catholic, but I didn't really have a personal relationship with the Lord. They prayed and prayed and prayed for me, and then they went away for the summer. When they came back here, I'd, be, I'd been baptized in the Spirit as a Catholic, charismatic. <laughs> now they happened to pray me the other way, you know. They didn't know what to do with me, and I was, but, uh, but no, I love, my, I love my Southern Baptist friends. Just treasure them. I love their, I love their, their, their devotion uh, to There's the a Lord. lot we can learn from them. I yeah. think they can learn a lot from us, but we can certainly learn a lot from them. Their love of Scripture, their love to evangelize, spontaneity and prayer, a, 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 kind of a sense that the Holy Spirit's really there, where us Catholics, we get kind of liturgical and stuck in a rut. Yeah. Uh, it, we it, well, the Catholic way, it's not either or, it's both end, right? We need to exactly, be able to do both. Exactly. So we, did, we, need, we can learn from them, and I think that's one of the reasons God has brought so many Protestant converts into the church, because we kind of bring in that evangelical spirit which is really a catholic spirit yeah it's it's the holy spirit but exactly. i gotta tell you when i was in israel when i saw you i guess it was two christmases or maybe three christmases ago um i was with father don calloway you know he surfs of course and cindy and i snuck in a day early before everybody else is it the don panorama is that the one that's down in, in tel aviv or is that the one they in have jerusalem? one down there they have them in jerusalem and, and up so north I, too well i probably stayed stayed i don't know but we were down there and now that the surf shops there no longer exist because they, re, you know, those beaches there in Tel Aviv, they had like that military pillboxes were, have been torn down. But I, we wandered out in the morning. We go, let's go see if we can get a surfboard. We go down to the beach and and uh, there's two surf shops. We go into the first one and go, hey, do you have a really big surfboard we could borrow? Well, why? And I said, well, well, you know, we, we, we tandem surf. I, I surf I, we paddle into waves and I lift my wife in these extreme lifts while we surf. You know, I don't know if you know I'm a world champion tandem surfer. I know that. That's why so, I think you're cool, too. And people wonder, <laughs> what the heck is that? Well, that's what it is. You, 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 it's the woman who's the extreme element. If she, this, she does these extreme lifts, really are acrobatic lifts. But they say, you can borrow my board. So we go out, we paddle out, and um, there's about 20 people there. And there's surf. There's surf that day in Tel Aviv. And... Uh, and uh, People are kind of like, who are these people? Why are on the same that huge surfboard? Why are they on the same board? And and Steve, finally, one of them came over and said uh, they kind of coaxed one of them to go over and talk to us. Like, so where are you guys from? Do you guys do you guys know how to surf? Because we looked like we were just goofing, right? And I go, no, this is our first time. And right then, <laughs> a, a sneaker a sneaker set came in, <clears throat> and. Um, we paddled in and we did this perfect overhead lift and it was like we were instantly part of the family. Oh and we started getting goodness. emails from all over Israel saying, are you coming back? We want to learn how to tandem. 
But then as I'm walking up the beach, kind of like the coolest thing happened as we're walking up the beach, there's this guy, uh, Golly is his name, I learned, with his arms crossed across his chest and he's just staring at me. And I'm walking up the beach, he goes, are you Bear Wozniak? And I go, yes, I am. And he goes, and then he, then he introduces himself to me. And it turns out uh, that we, there used to be a picture of us in his surf shop, the other, the, the competitive surf shop. But a friend of mine, uh, uh, Dr. Pa Doc Paskowitz, brought surfing to Israel. He's Jewish. Taught that man's son how to surf. Wow. And uh, no, taught that man's father how to surf. And I walk in and there's a picture of Doc there. And so we were like instant family. And that's what it's like when you're in the Catholic Church. You go into some remote area of, of the world and you go into a Catholic Church. It's the same thing. It's the tri It's that tribal, you know, the same, the, the liturgy, even though it's in a foreign language, you know what's going on. You know, there's that, there's that, there's that sense of being a family wherever you are in the world. When we were at Baptist, we had our Baptist church. And when we went on vacation or went somewhere, we left our church. When we became Catholic, my wife all of a sudden had this stunning revelation. We drove past a Catholic church somewhere else, and she goes, hey, that's our church. Yes, and then exactly. We went by another one, she goes, that's our church, too. Yeah. And now every time we drive past a church, we cross ourselves because we know Jesus is in there in the tabernacle. That's what my mom taught me. That's our church. I, that's ours. Yeah, it's it's like McDonald's franchise. It's the same everywhere, you know. It's like Jim Gaffigan says, if you haven't been to the, if you're Catholic and you haven't been to church in a while, it's still going on, you know. And it's a cool statement because it's from when we read the early church fathers, we see the primitive faith as it's as it's developing, as it's blossoming, not not evolving, but just coming into its fullness. But we see in the roots of that. And so, t t what was it that began your your journey into 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 studying the early church fathers and how did it begin to grasp your heart and your mind well i was always taught that the early church was christian and protestant when it came out of the gates yeah right? and then it fell and then it fell off into it yeah. became corrupted right away pagan elements came in things like worshiping mary and thinking there's magic at the altar and bread and wine actually change into the body uh, into another sacrifice of Christ. And we, we no longer can go to Jesus on our own. We have to have priests there as mediators for us and all, Oh, everything got so corrupted. And all it that wasn't false until, teaching. Yeah. Right. And it wasn't until Martin Luther came and he was so courageous that he came up out of the underground and he brought Christianity back to the real world again. And I remember uh, bear that I used to have, Martin Luther t-shirts I had made up because he was my hero. He was the his, uh, his uh, hero. Of, of he didn't even have a long beard, dude. No, he didn't. He had, <laughs> like all the church fathers. <laughs> and, he, and he came back out and he brought real Christianity. So I was always convinced that those guys were Protest, uh, Protestant. So when we started to have problems with Protestantism in 1993, we almost left the Christianity and became agnostics because of problems within Christ, uh, evangelical Protestantism, Mo like the the problem of division, what is worship, morality, every church has its right. own morality, all these kind of different problems. And, and the Bible alone is a huge problem as well. Well, anyway, I said, if I go back, a friend of mine, Al Cresta, you probably know of him. He became I love Catholic. Al. He, he meant a lot to me at the beginning of my ministry. He yeah. did, and he became Catholic. And him and I were best friends for 10 years before he became Catholic in 1982. And that just shook our world. Al, that's the stupidest thing we've ever heard. How can you become a Catholic? You're way too smart to be a Catholic. Yeah, yeah so he's a th that's why I say Catholic Church is the thinking man's religion. He's a, he is a smart guy. So we went back to, I said, let's go back to the very first Christians and we'll prove to Al that they were really Protestants and that to get him back. See, so I go back and I read Justin Martyr. Justin oh, that was Martyr, a bad, that was a mistake. That oh, was a big. <laughs> man, that's, that is subversive reading. Let me just set a warning out there for any Protestants listening. If you want to stay Protestant, don't ever, ever read the Apostolic Fathers. Don't do it. It'll, it's dangerous if you want to stay no, no, a Protestant. Okay, so the Apostolic Fathers, explain, explain who they are. Okay, Church Fathers are for the first 800 years. Okay, the Church Fathers are a period of 800 years. These are the men that really taught the faith, defined the faith. Defended um, the faith. Yes, defended the faith. Many of them died for it. Defended the creeds. All Justin Martyr now, died for it. But there's another category. They're still church fathers, but they're a special category called apostolic church fathers because they're the guys from the apostolic age. 
They're the guys, some of them, who knew the apostles. And they say that they had the words of the apostles ringing in their ears Amen. before there was a New Testament. Yeah. Now, if I could go back, Bear, and prove that those guys were who Protestant. It from the apostles <laughs> were Protestants, then I could not only get Al Cresta back out of the Catholic Church to become a real Bible Christian again, but I could also inoculate myself. And your family. Well, listen, we got to take a break, you know, and and, you know, it's so funny because I love this concept of the slippery slope. I use that word a lot, that phrase. Reading Augustine, he's always said everything before he used it in his own writings. The slippery yep. slope. You were on the slippery slope, and you had no idea. I always picture. Yeah, oh, no I always idea. picture this big, this 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 fight. John Wayne had one of his movies when they're wrestling and fighting, and they slide down the slippery slope into this this muddy puddle. But that was you. You were you were <laughs> you were walking on the ridge line. And had no idea how close you were to to the precipice. Yeah. We'll we'll be right back with Stephen Ray. This is the Bear Wozniak adventure. Men, are you looking for something that you can lead your sons through that will help them grow in manly virtue? Our new school of manliness provides you and your sons with 36 months of audio, video, and written lessons that includes a full toolbox with all of our long ride home TV series, all the video versions of the Bear Wozniak Adventure radio show, Bear's Daily Catechism, and a year video podcast, Pat Gervais, the Catholic Biker Daily Rosary, and a lot more. You can lead your sons of confirmation age and above through this manly school. Go to deepadventure.com and look into Bear's new school of manliness. Deep Adventure Ministries is grateful to Notre Dame Federal Credit Union for underwriting the Bear Wozniak Adventure on EWTN. Notre Dame Federal Credit Union provides car loans, mortgages, SBA loans, and depository accounts nationwide, as well as 24-hour support. Go to deepadventure.com to find their link or go to notredamefcu.com. Mahalo to Notre Dame Federal Credit Union for making the Bear Wozniak adventure possible. Yes, we mean you. Go to deepadventure.com and check out Bears Man Cave, a men's only Facebook group. Join the pack with other men as they challenge and inspire one another to manly virtue. Plus, you can dialogue with us in our regular video chat meetups. Plus, get your exclusive content. Join at deepadventure.com. That's deepadventure.com. Aloha. Welcome back to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. We want to invite the men to join Bear's Man Cave. It's a group of knuckle-dragging misfits similar to David's, uh, that the men that joined David at the, at the Cave of Adullam. You know, it says that they were misfits. They, they were running from maybe they owed money or they're running from the law. And I always like to say maybe running from their mother-in-law too. I don't know. But they gathered in this cave, and God formed them, but they also formed each other. And that's what Bear's Man Cave is. You can go to deepadventure.com and sign up to become a member, and then you get access to uh, secret, our secret Facebook. You get access to all of the Long Ride Home TV series, my books, early access to the, to the radio and TV shows. And also, every uh, couple of weeks, we have a Zoom video meetup. So you can, you can grow uh, and and. and, and and, and uh, go deeper with the Lord. I think so many men are isolated and lonely. Uh, they're shamed by their own failings. They don't know where to go to get traction. And this is the place because you'll, you'll feel right at home. If you feel like you might not fit in, then you're, you'll fit in perfect with us. When I was young, I went to Baylor University, Stephen. We started a cl- club called, um, uh, it, the, the, our motto was, the one social club for the non-socialite. <laughs> That's kind of like what the man cave is. So go to deepadventure.com and, and join. I also want to remind everybody we got our big Deep Adventure Quest luau slash retreat here coming up in Waikiki December 7th through the 11th. So you can go to deepadventure.com, find out more about that. Our guest today is Dr. Stephen Ray, uh, a man that really uh, is responsible for me coming back to the Catholic faith. So he's so so important for him to be with me. We're talking about the apostolic fathers. 
you know, it was a Polycarp who was who was. I forget their lineage back to John. Was it Polycarp? Yep, I'll I'll explain it. And by the way, I'll I'll accept that doctorate. I never received any degree. I'm just I'm self taught. I so and, many people but, call you Doctor Stephen Ray though. So but if you want to if you want to elevate me to doctor, I will accept that honorary doctorate. I, I saw your your chest puff out right there. Right? <laughs> no, <my laughs> you goodness. rooster ooh, just ooh. a little bit. <laughs> uh, the fathers of the church. They, they're heroic men. And one of the things I, I like to say about them is when a bishop becomes a bishop today, they hand him his miter and his crozier, and he goes over to the bishop's mansion there, the house, and he's got a church built already, and he's got a staff and all the liturgy, everything's ready. When these guys became bishops, there was nothing. They had to take a machete and chop their way through the jungle. There was no road prepared for them. They didn't have a mansion or a church built or a cathedral. These guys took on their robes, and on their robes was a big bullseye, and that right. was they were a target. Becoming right. a bishop back in those days meant that you were setting yourself up to be killed for the faith because there was a lot of martyrs in the first 300 years. The first 30 popes were martyrs. When a new pope took the chair of Peter, he knew he was probably going to die as a martyr. These guys were heroic men, and yet they followed the teaching of Jesus and the church, and they developed what wasn't there yet. They chopped the road in a sense. Right. In my movie, Apostolic Fathers, by the way, I'll show you that. Uh, it's Apostolic Fathers, and it's about these guys, and it's about the first five that I, there's more, but I got these first five. It's called Apostolic Fathers, and I follow their life through Turkey and uh, Syria and Israel and France and these places where they were, and I start the movie you, you say I'm kind of a wild man, too. I start the movie, and all of a sudden you hear this, and this bulldozer's coming through the woods, knocking trees down. And I get off the bulldozer, and I put the blade down, and I say, I am like the early church fathers because I have to plow the road through this forest. And they had to plow the first road for the Catholic Church. There was no road for them. These guys took machetes and bulldozers, and they made the way for us. Then I get back on the bulldozer, and I go back through the woods again. So, you know, I, I have fun doing this, too, just like you do. You know, we have a good time. But these guys were very heroic, and they were Catholics. They were so Catholic, and they were willing to die just in martyr. I'll tell you the timeline. Jesus taught John the Apostle. He's the one that had his head on Jesus's chest during the first Eucharist. John then went out and taught a man. And he named he lived Polycarp. a long. He was the longest living apostle. So yeah, so, he lived until so, almost hundred AD. So he, he lived into the time of, of some of the early. Yes, and he's Church the only fathers. one yeah. of the uh, apostles that did not die a martyr. He died right. of natural causes. A very old, but in his older years, he taught a man named Polycarp which does not mean many fish, polycarp. It means much <laughs> fruit. And I, you know, I had to learn that one. I said, oh, what that's name? funny. <laughs> but in, in Greek, it means much fruit. Uh, mm. Carp is fruit. Poly is many. So he, John taught polycarp. And then there's a guy named Irenaeus. He's up oh, from the I love of Irenaeus. France today. I yeah, love Irenaeus. Over there in Lyon, right. Him and August, Ignatius of Antioch almost single-handedly made me Catholic. But he says that I remember the days of my youth when I sat at the feet of Polycarp and he told us all of the things which he heard and saw from John and he I he heard the stories from John of all the miracles Jesus had done so you have Jesus teaching John teaching Polycarp and then Irenaeus sitting at the feet of Polycarp now you could still read the writings of John of course and you have a letter from written by Polycarp and you have seven letters by Ignatius of Antioch and a huge letter called Against Heresies by Irenaeus and you could sit and read that this is a second century Christian didn't have a New Testament yet and he's basing all his teaching on what he learned from the apostles right well I mean the the the, the memoirs of the apostles Yes, as it, memoirs. As it said, exactly. I love that. We now yeah. call gospels, but they refer to them as memoirs. He had uh, those, perhaps, or some of those, but and had some, maybe, perhaps, some of the writings of Paul. But it was before the scriptures were even canonized. And what I love about Irenaeus is he he wrote this mostly against the Gnostic heresy, which again is basically re uh, rears its ugly head through history. We see it now, kind of in the New Age movement. But he uh, he he says that at some point, uh, humbly submits his thoughts. To uh, to Rome, 
If there's yes. anything here that I've said that is 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 that Rome takes exception to in so many words, there was already the understanding of and you and of course you see the writings of Clement the third I think that he was the third pope, uh, writing his his. Uh, <laughs> you're I also wrote your, this book that goes through the first eight centuries and shows it's called Upon This Rock that shows uh, that all of the early Christians these fathers recognized the authority of Rome, and their doctrine even from the time of Saint Paul where he says I went up to Jerusalem. Jerusalem, right, and I submitted my gospel to Peter and the church. Amen. I mean, you know, and think about it. Upon this rock, like, think about this. Uh, you know, you, you've seen that the, the statue there in in Israel of uh, uh, based on the shroud of Jesus. Yes, yes, yeah, right it's there in that Notre hotel. Dame. Yeah, Notre oh, and, Dame and, Hotel. It, yeah, okay, that's where we were staying. And it, the one there is bronze. It's not in white. But when you when you go and see the wounds of Christ, you can see. You can see because it's a three. The shroud displays a three-dimensional image. Uh, it shows kind of a strong man. I mean, Jesus wasn't a, necessarily a carpenter. He was oh, a tech. I'll tell you about that. Let me <laughs> okay, tell you okay. about that. Yeah, well, okay. Been, I want, let, me, let, me, let me say something. Then I want you to roll. Okay. Okay. I'm gonna set you up. I'm gonna give you a. Uh, I'm gonna give you the platform to say. He was a tecton. He was builder. He was strong. We don't know of anything that he built except for he said, "I will build my church." And he built it on a rock. He's the cornerstone, but he built it on this rock of Peter. Jesus, Jesus knew what he was doing. He knew he might have known how to work with wood, but if you go to Israel, there's no houses made of wood except for maybe the prime minister's residence. He he worked with rock, maybe wood too, but he was strong and he knew how to set something in stone. He knew how to build something. He didn't just say, "Here's the gospel, go run wild." He had a plan, and part of that plan was the authority structure, and Peter was that rock. So now I've give, given you the platform. Uh, run with it. i got to take a break in two minutes, but after that you can come back and run some more. <laughs> well said, because uh, I, I'm giving talks now all over the country about St. Joseph, because it's the year of St. Joseph. Amen. And I tell the guys, I say, I want you to know that Joseph was no wimpy guy with lotion soft hands holding a flower. He these <laughs> pictures of him being so effeminate, I don't like them. He Me is neither. a manly man. I tell the guys, I said, Joseph was made of steel. He walked everywhere. He was a stonemason. That's what he and Jesus did. And we took a group right before the COVID hysteria hit. We were in a, a city called Sepphoris, where Jesus and Joseph worked during the day. And that city's all made out of stone. And I said to the people, that stone right there could have been put in that wall by Jesus Ma Mary's Joseph. house. Mary's house was carved into a cave and then the rocks quarried right. from that were built exactly. built out that built that were built out you know using the very rocks from in that cave and you i to said Israel, that joseph joseph could pick any one of you guys up and throw you over a wall amen he could, that's he right could wrestle you to the ground and jesus pin you too to the ground in two <laughs> seconds either one of them could they could take on any four of you guys and pin you to the ground these were muscular manly men and i think that men ought to see jesus and joseph as manly men and not effeminate sissy guys and that's the way so often they're presented that way and i have been to israel over 180 times i've been to nazareth 160 50 times at least and i've walked over the over the oh, hillside down it's to a Sepphoris. workout and it's and it's a draw and it's it, you got to be carrying your own water because there isn't any water along the These way guys you know are, they were tough guys you know they were i like to say bear what did the holy family do first thing they got up in the morning everybody says pray they went and got water <laughs> no i said what do you do first thing in the morning you go to the bathroom for heaven's sakes and they didn't have running water and toilets there was a rough rugged life and mary had to go get the water and in nazareth well, now, the water well, 15 minutes away well now that we're talking about with Stephen ray about the, our morning sabbatical uh <laughs> we'll be right back with more of the bear wasnick adventure <laughs> Deep Adventure Ministries is grateful to Notre Dame Federal Credit Union for underwriting the Bear Wozniak Adventure on EWTN. Notre Dame Federal Credit Union provides car loans, mortgages, SBA loans, and depository accounts nationwide, as well as 24-hour support. Go to deepadventure.com to find their link or go to NotreDameFCU.com. Mahalo to Notre Dame Federal Credit Union for making the Bear Wozniak adventure possible. This is a warning. The Bear Wozniak adventure is dangerous. The radical change Bear challenges you to 
is not for wimps. Change this station now to a soft rock station before it's too late. You've been warned. Now, here is Fair Wasnick. Aloha, welcome back to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. We want to thank our mama bears out there. You can go to deepadventure.com. The mama bears are the ones that really pray for our ministry and are involved in, uh, and they love what they receive so much from what, from what we teach. Because we knew if our message was, was gritty enough and real enough for the men, the women would already be there. But you're the ones that pray for your men and pray for our ministry. And uh, we have a special place for you if you go to deepadventure.com and you can join, click on join the mama bears. You get a, a, you become part of our mug club and you get a lot of other benefits. But one of the things is someone sent us these, these mama bear uh, teddy bears. And they're Catholic biker. It's a Catholic biker teddy bear. And we have about 40 of them left. So as the mama bears join, you, you'll be one of those who gets this. But we think of mama bears. My son Jeremiah and I, my son Joshua especially, loves Montana. He used to have a cabin up there by Glacier Park. We know what a mama bear can do. They're vicious, they're furious, they're not soft and cuddly. Uh, and, we, and that's why we love having them as part of our ministry. So go to deepadventure.com, mama bears, and become part. And if you have something you want to write to us, anybody that has any questions or comments, you can go to deepadventure.com, press on contact, and write to us. We love to hear from you guys. We're here with Dr. Stephen Ray. We're talking about, uh, I'm working on a new book, by the way, called The 12 Rules of Manliness. It's okay to be manly. Man, people say, well, let's talk about Catholic masculinity. No. Uh, let's talk about masculine spirituality. No. Let's talk about manliness, because the ultimate man, man is a Catholic man who's totally devoted to the Lord and giving his life in heroic virtue to the people around him. That's what being manly is. So, men, stop excusing and apologizing yourself. Don't be macho. Be manly. And that's what we got Stephen Ray here with us, someone who very much meant— uh, brought, helped bring me back to the Catholic Church through his book, Crossing the Tiber. And what was the other book you showed me a moment ago? And then you have another one you wanted to show me? I got Upon This Rock, which is a study of the early papacy, of the of the early church fathers, and all the biblical passages dealing with the fact that there's going to be a pope in Rome and all the fathers are confirming it. And then, as long as you ask, I got another book. It's 450 pages on the Gospel of St. John. Amen. And this one goes verse by verse, brings out all the Jewish and background hi cultural history. When do you and have time to do? Okay, so when do you I also write got this? This one called the Catholic Faith, which is a study of the creeds, and I'm just now finishing. Oh, I my want to read that. Genesis. It's not just what the you know. Well, you know, the Catechism takes you through the creeds. You know, it, it yeah. one of the things it does takes you through one of the creeds, but the history of them. Yep. The battles that were fought. Is. I mean, the people go, "Who's your favorite saint?" I really dig on Saint Athanasius. You know, I, I, I love I, that dude. Patron saint. Me too. Well, I, yeah, I, I love ran him. Downstairs, you. I sorry to interrupt you. It's, it's dangerous to get two guys. You, you like have you, you have eight back. minutes, and I'm just going to give it to you. Run. All right. Well, See. here is a look at this. You know what that is? That is a sling stone. Oh, that's a big one. That's See big. how round it is? The sling yeah. stones were about the size of tennis balls. And when they do archaeology right. at the base of city walls, they find piles of these because oh, when they're Oh, my fighting. goodness. And so this is one of the sling stones. But I found this one in the cave of Adullam. Oh, my gosh. That's so, so cool. Look at it. Oh. See, it's broken. You got to send and me a this, picture of that. You got to send me a picture of you, and, of and you holding it. I, the cave of Adullam, I found it. It's in my movie on David and Solomon that I made. We found the cave of Adullam, and it's huge, but it's in a bunch of tangled brush. Nobody even knows it's there. It would hold 400 guys. It's big enough for 400. I found this in the back of that cave, and I think that it broke because at night these soldiers would chip rocks and make them round so that when they threw them, they'd go straight. Right. And this one was broke, and they left it there. I'm convinced that this is one from David's 30 Mighty Men, and I uh. found it in the cave of Adullam. Them. Is that cool or what? I didn't think they were that big. Now they yeah, were using they that with slingshots, thing. right? That's what they use the slingshot. They, what for. they what they did is they have two leather thongs with a yeah. a pocket in the middle, and they would swing that thing, and then they would let one of the strings go, and the rock would fling out. And and there in the book of Judges it says that the tribe of Benjamin had seven hundred had seven hundred slingers that could sling a stone with their left hand at a hair and never miss. With their left hand, not and left-handed slingers, so they could do left and right. But they're and saying they even hit a, and, it's, and that could hit a hair at a hundred feet and never miss. It says, and so I bet it would get the there size. almost as fast as a bullet. I mean, that thing. But, and this is, by the way, a, a spearhead from the time. Is of that David. flint or what is that? No, this is bronze. Oh, it's bronze. 
I got this at an antiquity dealer in Israel. This is a bronze spear tip from the time of David. And you wonder what, if that ever impaled anybody. I mean, yeah, you have or, no or, idea. I mean, the the, the 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 battle there was close quarters. There was none of oh, this drone fighting. And, and these guys were the artillery guys. They would get you from a distance. And you know, and the and, and 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 then you bring that back to the to our our walk uh, as men in the Lord. That we need to be protectors. We need to be able. We need to be, be know how to fight the good fight. Yep. And and you know the enemy has his arrows. Uh, you know the lies and and the 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 the, the attacks of the enemy. We're seeing so much today. The but flaming men, darts of the but, devil. But you know I was I think do you remember the name I was reading? Um, uh, Carol, Warren Carroll's all those history books he's writ, written. I read read yep. all those books a couple of times. But somewhere in there, and I lost it. There was a general, I believe he was in Spain. Who was covered with? He had injuries, but only on the front. He wore he wore his he wore his um, his battle armor, but he was but he was he didn't have he, he had cuts and everything else, but it was on the front of his body. Now that he was on the attack, yep. And we and, and when we go out, we do our when we go out and do our long ride home TV shoots, and I bet you experience this too. People say, "Well, do you ever come under spiritual attack?" And I go, "No, we're on the attack. We might experience resistance." But we're on the attack. You know, they're the ones coming under spiritual attack. The enemy. I'm talking about the demonic forces. Tell, tell us more about what that, what, what manliness, the, the nature of Joseph and, and, and Jesus and the, the early apostles. Just about what it meant to be a, a man in those days and what we can learn from them. Being a man was tough in those days because you you did uh, manliness was a desired quality. We hear today, you're talking about men being pushed down. It's not just ourselves that'll push ourselves down, but the whole culture is against us. Movies and TVs make fun of men. They ridicule us. The whole but we're not victims. We're not no, going to put up with it. Most men are, though. Unfortunately, there's a lot of men who are victims, and they lose their manliness, and they become wimpy, and they don't do the things. They don't stand up and put their pants on and be a husband and a father and their family and a man in the church. So many of them are. But the, you and I and those that we're encouraging, we're not going to get pushed down by the feminist ideology and the whole kind of thing going on in our world today. We're going to stand up and be men. Joseph and Jesus were proud to be men. They were manly men. In fact, that's the title of my talk, Joseph, the manly man and the chosen father. Father. What kind of man would God put in front of his son? Let's face it, Jesus is the son of God. He gave Joseph the prerogatives of father. He said, look at, I'm his father, but I'm going to let you be his father for a while. Amen. And yeah. You'll be a darn good father. And what kind of a man would God put his son under the care of? A, a gentle, a gentle, effeminate Gender I, I neutral. like to say that Joseph had a fist, a, a fist of steel. Have you ever shook a, a chicken a man's? Go, sorry, go ahead. In a velvet glove. Yeah, that's that's, that's my expression. You stole it from me. We must I have stole. That. We must have stolen it from Augustine, I guess. But I love that. <laughs> I know men like that. But you know that that type of man, you shake their hand, you go, oh. You know, I shook I shook a man's hand the other day, and it made me want to throw up. It was so soft, and he didn't hardly oh, even I clench know. his. Uh, but that's a big My part of it. Kids. It, it, I, it, I have 18 grandkids, and, and they, the first time I shook hands with them, it was kind of like this. I said, what is that? That's like a dead fish. I said, here's how you shake hands. And I told all of my grandsons, come over here. This is how you shake hands if you want the respect of other people. You take their hand, and you grab it, and you look them straight in the eye. And you shake right. their hand and say, nice to meet you, sir. Now right. those grandkids, wherever they grab that. I, you know, the kind of handshake <laughs> that I like is the one where you shake it and it all, you almost go to your knees because it's a strong handshake. Yeah, and the, and the and person doesn't shake. even mean to make to be that strong. And that's I what know. Joseph and Jesus would have been like. Absolutely. Jesus, Jesus isn't Absolutely. this soft. This isn't this soft, nice man. He came. He said, "Don't think I've come to bring peace. I've come to bring, um, I've come to bring uh, a fire." You know. Yep, the fire of the, the Holy sword. Spirit, the sword of the Spirit, but and, and think about that. But so so Stephen, what what is uh, what is your word to people that are on the fence in their faith? That we have just a couple more minutes. Man, it flies by. We're going to have you right back if you don't if you can give us some time. But oh, what, sure, what do you say for those I that like are kind of? I love I love you, man. You know you've changed my, you changed my life. But but what would you say to those men and women who are kind of straddling the fence and and don't know are, are you know they don't want to go against the flow? Catholics have always gone against the flow. That's the nature of being of course, a Christian. Of course. What, what I have a talk called Swimming Upstream. If Man. you want to be a real Catholic, you have to swim upstream. That's the, for my stamina. expression. You must have stolen that from St. Augustine, too, maybe. I don't know. But I, I love think that. You and I, swim I just think 
we think a lot alike. I think that's the deal. We think a lot alike. But my talk swimming upstream is how to live a Catholic life in a pagan world. We are no longer the mainstream. We are now a despised subculture. And the more the world gets worldly and secular and materialistic, the more we're going to be despised. There was no time to sit on a fence. When there's a war, guess what happens if you sit on the fence? You get hit from both sides. Both <laughs> sides. You get shot. That's bullets true. are flying. Don't sit. You don't have time or the luxury anymore to sit on the fence. You have to pick sides where you're going to be for this battle. And there is a battle. And it's going to affect your sons and your daughters and your wife and all the people around you. Men need to stand up and be men. They need to take sides. They need to get into the fight. And it says in Ephesians chapter 6, put on the full armor of God. Take up the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Put on the shield of faith and the sandals of peace and get ready for a battle. There's no time but, for sitting but, but, on the fence. But, but Stephen, what about the, the, the armor on your back? Well, I don't. I, who cares? Well, I'm the, not Bi- turn the Bible. And run. The Bible doesn't the, only, men, the Bible doesn't mention any armor on no, the back. Because the only time you're going to use that is if you're turning tail to run. Okay, then you're well, going to have to have. We I'm got. Gonna, we we, we got to go. We got to go. I got to tell you one quick thing, and that is my friend Archie Kalepa, the head lifeguard in Maui. I was with him one day. And it's kind of tragic, but a call came in and they said there's been a shark attack on the on the on the side where my parents lived. And he goes, Don't tell me he got bit in the hindquarters. He used a different word. And they go, Yeah, he did. Right? So when a shark attacks, you don't turn and run. You gotta turn and face it. My mother wrote a book about turn you know, fa- turn and face the the, the tiger issues in your life that are that, that puts you on the run. You gotta turn and face it. And when what how people get killed in a shark attack is they'd run and then the, then the shark pursues them, and they get bit from behind. And there's a, I saw a, a World Surfing League contest once where one of the men was attacked by a, by a great white down in South Africa. The other surfer in the water that was competing with him didn't run to the beach. He paddled to his friend's aid. And that's what we need as men is to turn and face the danger. Don't run from it. And I promise you, if Stephen Ray will come back, we'll, we'll, get, we'll get back together and have part two of this you got as much to say as these 24 commentaries or whatever these are that I have on the early church fathers. <laughs> Stephen, we got to go. How can they find you? Get CatholicConvert.com. CatholicConvert.com. And, you're, and if you're going to go to Israel or you're going to go to visit uh, the footsteps of St. Paul or any other great pilgrimage, you should contact Stephen Ray. Thank you. God bless you. I had a lot of fun. The time went fast. I love you. And they call you Jerusalem Jones, right? Yep. Are, JerusalemJones.com are. goes to my site, too. We're a minute past our time, dude. we got to go. Thank you, Stephen Ray. I'm going to write to you and ask you to come back as soon as possible. I'll be there. Okay, love you, brother. Say hi to your Ohana and all your family. Until next time, may the breath of the Holy Spirit aloha you. Aloha. Hey, man, I don't want you to miss out on your free stuff at deepadventure.com. Go there and subscribe to our weekly email newsletter. You get free video content, including the Bear Wozniak radio show, video version on YouTube before it even airs on EWTN. And you can follow us on all of our social media. Go to deepadventure.com and subscribe. Get your free stuff. And if you're watching on YouTube, don't forget to press the subscribe button and ring that little bell. Don't miss out.